Hi everybody and welcome back to Educating Adventures. Today we are going to be talking about one of the most extreme ecosystems on the planet. We're going to be talking about a place that's really cold and really hard for lots of organisms to live. So I'm so happy you guys are here today with me while we learn all about the tundra. Like all ecosystems, the tundra ecosystem is defined by the living and the non-living things that are found there and how they interact with one another. So there's a couple things that come to mind right away when I think about the tundra. So I wanna give you guys a chance. What do you already know about a tundra ecosystem? This would be a good time to stop the video so you guys can discuss as a class some of the things that you might already know about a tundra ecosystem. All right, are you ready? So when I think about the tundra, there's a couple things that come to mind right away. And one of those things is that it is very, very cold in the tundra. It is freezing for almost the entire year, which is a really big challenge that living organisms have to overcome when they live in the tundra. Another thing that I think about is that there's not a lot of rain in the tundra. So sometimes scientists actually even refer to the tundra as a frozen desert because just like a hot desert, there's not a lot of rain that falls in the tundra. They might get a lot of snow. There's a very icy landscape in the tundra, but not a lot of rainfall. So freezing temperatures and not a lot of rain. These are just some of the things that plants and animals have to overcome along with having really harsh wind. And we're gonna talk about that more in just a couple minutes, but some of the reasons that the tundra is a really hard place for animals and plants to live is because it is so far away from the equator. Usually when we think of a tundra, we think of them being up by the North Pole or down by the South Pole, places that are really, really far away from the equator and have really extreme seasons. So by the North Pole and the South Pole, the summers are not too warm and they're really short. And during the summer, it's light for almost the entire day. But then during the winter, which takes up most of the year, it is dark for almost the entire day. And it gets freezing cold, which makes it really, really challenging for organisms to live there. So now we've learned a little bit about some of the non-living things. And some of those things, again, were the temperature and the lack of rainfall and the wind. And there is another ecosystem up by the tundra that does have to deal with some of these same challenges, and that is the boreal forest, also known as the taiga. And the boreal forest is really different from the tundra because there are lots of trees in a boreal forest, which makes sense for a forest, right? A boreal forest is filled with pine trees, evergreen trees that are made of, their leaves are little needles. So they're very specialized to grow in this really harsh ecosystem. In the tundra, it's almost lifeless. There are not a lot of plants that grow. If there are plants, they are certainly not growing tall like a tree. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time here talking about some of the few plants and animals that live in the tundra and how they have adapted to overcome all of these challenges. When we think of some of the biotic or some of the living things that we might find in a tundra ecosystem, we might find just a couple very special plants. And some of those plants might be arctic moss, it might be very small shrubs like a cushion plant, or there are even some grasses that have adapted to grow in a tundra ecosystem. And there's a couple things that the plants that live there have kind of adapted to deal with all of these harsh abiotic or non-living factors that we just mentioned. So a lot of the plants that live there grow really low to the ground. We mentioned in the tundra, we're not gonna be finding those really tall trees. Instead, the plants grow really low to the ground because all of that harsh wind that's blowing through, that means there's less area for that wind to hit. If they're nice and low to the ground, the wind can kind of just go right over them. 
They also a lot of the times have very small leaves that help reduce some of that water that might be trying to escape. Remember we said there's not a lot of rain there. So storing that water inside of their leaves and their stems, that's really important. So having little leaves helps trap some of that water inside. And a lot of these times, the leaves are dark in color. If you guys have ever been outside and you're wearing a dark shirt, you might notice that it gets really hot. When the sun shines down on something that's dark, it absorbs some of that sunlight. Whereas if you're wearing a white t-shirt, that sun can kind of bounce off of you and help keep you cool. So in a very cold ecosystem, for plants to have dark leaves helps them absorb some of that sunlight and also helps to kind of keep them warm. The coolest thing about Arctic plants, especially plants in the tundra, is that most of them only grow seasonally. So during the really harsh winters when it's dark and really cold, plants can kind of go to sleep. We say that they go dormant. They don't really grow, they just kind of hang out underneath the snow trying to stay alive. And then in the spring when some of that snow starts to melt, that is when they can start growing and producing flowers. They produce flowers really quickly because it is a short growing season in the tundra. And these plants that produce seeds, this is where that wind comes in handy. The wind can carry the seeds all around the tundra and help spread some of these plants around. So even though there are not a lot of plants in a tundra ecosystem, there are a few and they are very well designed to survive in this really harsh ecosystem. Now we've talked a little bit about the plants that we might find in the tundra, those biotic factors. Let's talk about a different biotic factor. Let's talk about some of the animals that we might find in the tundra. And for me, the first animal that comes to mind is a polar bear. And polar bears are very well designed, just like some of the plants and just like you'll see about the rest of the animals that we're gonna talk about. They're very special. They have lots of great adaptations that help them to survive in this really harsh ecosystem. And polar bears have a lot of great adaptations. Of course, they have that thick, fur, right? That fur is kind of like a coat that they wear outside of their bodies, helps to keep them warm. And that fur is very special at wicking away water. So once they're done swimming in the ocean looking for seals, they can come out and they don't have to worry about being sopping wet. Their fur kind of stays dry. They can just shake that water off. Underneath that fur, they have a very thick layer of blubber or fat which again, helps those polar bears stay warm in that really cold ecosystem. Their fur also blends in with the snow. So this helps them, again, sneak up on any of those seals that they might be trying to hunt. And lastly, one of the great things they have are really big feet. So having big feet not only helps them stay on top of the snow, but it also helps them swim when they're in the water trying to hunt some of those seals. And another animal that is actually named for having very big feet is our snowshoe hare. And snowshoe hares, just like their name says, they have big feet that work like snowshoes and help them stay up on top of the snow. Compared to some other types of rabbits, they also have kind of small ears. So having small features like ears helps trap some of that heat inside their body. If they had really big ears, it'd be easy for heat to escape. So having small ears traps some of that warmth in. And something really cool about a snowshoe hare is that their camouflage works in all the different seasons. So in the winter, when it's really snowy and there's ice, their fur is white. And then in the spring, they start to lose some of that white fur as the snow melts, and they actually get kind of this brownish color, which helps them blend in. And that's important for a snowshoe hare because they are gonna be avoiding predators that might be lurking around in the tundra. One of those predators that a snowshoe hare might be trying to avoid is an Arctic fox. And just like a snowshoe hare, they also have great camouflage. In the winter, some of them are white. And then in the summer, during those warmer months when the snow melts, their fur can turn kind of a brownish gray color. So it's a little bit different than the snowshoe hare who's trying to hide from predators. An Arctic fox is using that camouflage to sneak up on all their different prey items. 
And just like we mentioned about the snowshoe hare who has little ears, so does an arctic fox that helps trap in some of those heat. They also have short legs, which again, helps trap in some of that heat. And they have really special feet. Their paws are totally covered in fur. So it's kind of like they're wearing socks or boots. And this helps keep their little toes warm while they're walking around in the really cold tundra ecosystem. Something else that animals do that is very, very cool, and actually animals in all sorts of different ecosystems will do this, is they migrate. So if we picture an animal like a snowy owl, they can travel away from the tundra during the winter. They can fly south somewhere where it's a little bit warmer. And then in the summer and in the spring, they can fly back up to the tundra and find all of the food and survive in that a little bit warmer habitat in the summertime. Snowy owls also are white in color. That helps them camouflage to sneak up on any prey and they have feathers on their legs, which is something really unique. Not a lot of owls have feathers on their legs, so it's kind of like they're wearing snow pants. It helps them stay warm even when it's a little bit cold outside. So all of these different animals and the plants we mentioned are really special. If we moved some of these organisms to a different habitat, they probably wouldn't survive as well as they do in the tundra. So even though the tundra is a super, super challenging place for organisms to live, some of them have kind of mastered it. So I hope you guys have this brand new appreciation for the tundra, even though it is really harsh and a challenging place for animals to live, it has led to some really, really cool and unique organisms. Thank you guys for spending some time with me today, and I hope I see you guys on our next educating adventure.